Well, good morning to you. Can you hear me out there? All right. Awesome. Well, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I invite you to open with me to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. Philippians 4, we're going to be starting there in verse 4. And uh, this morning is a beautiful day, and we do thank God for that. We've got a a few announcements before we get started. Uh, We're very excited that next week, June 7th, we are planning to be back in the sanctuary with our two services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., and so we're thankful for that. We look forward to that. And so uh, come next week, and and of course, necessarily, things are going to look a little bit different. We're going to have fewer seats in the auditorium. Uh, We're going to have hand sanitizer, and of course, uh, we encourage social distancing as we gather back together. But we are excited uh, to be able to see one another and interact with one another. And uh, and I I love just even walking around a little bit this morning. I wish I could talk to everyone and catch up over the last three months. It's crazy, uh, everything that's been going on. But we're so thankful and and plan on that next Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, I also want to give a shout out. You're tuning in on 88.7, but this is what we discovered the last time is that the, the broadcast signal that we have actually goes a lot farther than we realize. So uh, we've got some who had to stay home today, but I want to give a shout out to Sherman and Sousa Davis. If you're listening to me, hello in your living room. Uh, also, Bonnie Ogle, if you're out there, hello to you. Anna Johnson, if you're listening in, hello to you. I hope that they are tuning in. And of course, all of you here in the parking lot, welcome to church this morning. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to dive in. And of course, uh, this, is, this has been a, a crazy time. I was talking to someone this week. They said if they hear the phrase uncertain times anymore, they're likely to punch someone because they've heard it so much. And I think that's the point where all of us are at. We're tired of this. We're tired of everything that's going on. And to add to it, it's not just COVID-19. It's not just a pandemic. But there's all kinds of things going on, all kinds of unrest in our culture, in our country. And and we want answers, don't we? We want a sense of peace amidst all of the anxiety. And uh, we can imagine a time, can't we, when racial, racial tensions are high, when disease runs rampant. We can imagine a time when Christians are persecuted. But what's interesting this morning, and this is what I love about the scriptures, is as we look to the scriptures this morning, we are looking into a time that is very much like ours, except even worse. You see, we're going to read from the book of Philippians this morning, written by the Apostle Paul as he was imprisoned. And he was in prison there, likely in Rome, as he was there awaiting trial. And yet, even in the midst of prison and persecution, even in the midst of a world that was racially hot because Paul was a Jew and Jews were looked down on at that time, as they, are, as they have been for a long time, even in the midst of a world where so much was uncertain in Paul's life, he wrote this letter to the Philippians that I believe has a message for us in 2020 today. And so, uh, as we look at this, uh, we're going to start there in chapter 4. In verse 4, but I want to tell a little bit of a story before we do. Of course, uh, every night, Valissa and I put our girls to bed, and, uh, and our girls are old enough to where they're watching some Disney princess movies, and every good Disney, pr- Disney princess movie has a villain. And uh, their favorite movie right now is Sleeping Beauty, and so the villain there is Maleficent. And uh, so at times, especially when I put the girls down, I don't know why it just seems to happen to me. I think it's because the girls know how to play me a little bit better than Velissa. But I'll go in there and I'll put them down. And as I'm about to walk out the door, they'll say, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared. And I'll say, well, Adelaide and Sayla, what are you scared of? And they'll say, I'm, I'm scared of Maleficent. I'm, I'm scared she's going to come and get me. And I'll try to explain to them, listen, Girls, Maleficent's not real. There's nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to be afraid of her. She's just a cartoon. She's not real. But daddy, daddy, I'm scared. And after a couple more minutes, I realize I've just got to head for the exit here and pray that they go to sleep because really they're not even scared. They just want daddy to stay a little bit longer. But I I try to explain to them, listen, listen, there's nothing to be afraid of. And of course, that's true when it, when it comes to a cartoon coming out of a TV. There's nothing to be afraid of. But the truth is this, and I don't say this, I, I see my wife back there, so hi to Adelaide and Sayla and Griff. I don't tell my girls this very often, but the truth is this. In our world, there is a lot to be afraid of, isn't there? There's a lot that we don't control. And yes, while, while Disney villains are just cartoons, there's a lot of evil in the world. And yet, here's what the Bible says over and over again. The most common commandment in all of Scripture is don't be afraid. 
And here's what I want us to see this morning. Paul is going to tell us something that, that might seem a little bit like Pollyanna. It might seem a little bit too good to be true. Or it might seem like, Paul, you're just trying to get us to look through the world with rose-colored glasses. And what I want to convince you of first this morning is that Paul wasn't looking at the world through the wrong lens. Paul was w- looking at the world through the only right lens. And he's not trying to say to us this morning that there's nothing to be afraid of or there's nothing to concern us or that there's no evil in the world. He's trying to remind us of a truth that beyond the evil, above the evil, more powerful than the evil in a way that evil can never touch, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the glory of God is with us and for us. And if we will look to him, we will always have reason not to be afraid, but to rejoice. And that's where we're going to dive in this morning. In Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4, it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, let's pause right here and reflect on the fact again that Paul is imprisoned. Paul does not know if he is going to live or die. Paul does not know anything that's about to happen to him. His future is uncertain. And yet, his word to the Philippians, who, by the way, wrote to Paul because they were trying to make sure that Paul was okay. They were trying to make sure that Paul was taken care of. He writes back to the Philippians and says, Philippians, here's what I want to tell you. Even though I'm imprisoned, I want you to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, I want to pause right there and notice something with me in verse 4. Paul doesn't just say rejoice. He says rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. In other words, he's not saying stick your head in the sand and ignore the world around you. He's not saying ignore evil or ignore the, the threats that are around you. No, he's saying in light of who the Lord is, in light of what the Lord has promised, in light of what the Lord has done, we always have reason to rejoice. So he commands them, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And you know, we live in a culture that is hotly divided. Have you noticed that? Uh, Maybe you've been on Facebook and you noticed that there's division in terms of of racial division. Or maybe you've noticed that there's division in terms of how we should respond to COVID-19. And it's very interesting to me in terms of the response. Here's what I know, that in this parking lot this morning, there are people who are scared to death. There are people who will not go out other than staying in their car. There are people who know and believe that if they get COVID-19, it could be a serious health issue, even to the point of costing them their life. And yet there are also people in the parking lot this morning who are just as equally convinced that the whole thing is totally overblown, that the whole thing is basically a giant oax, and that we should all get back to normal as soon as possible. There are people in this parking lot this morning, right before my eyes, who believe both of those things. And listen, I'm not about to try and convince you one way or or the other in terms of how serious COVID-19 is, but here's what I want you to see. There is genuine disagreement. And yet as Christians, our call, our duty is to look to one another, to look to our brothers and sisters in Christ and the larger community that God has placed us in and to put love and sacrifice above our own thought, above our own preference. And so uh, here's what Satan wants us to do. Satan doesn't want us to rejoice in the Lord. Satan wants us to divide over issues that ultimately in the grand scheme of God's plan are insignificant. Satan wants us to focus on our differences, and instead of joy filling our hearts, he wants bitterness and anger and disagreement to fill our hearts. And yet, here's what Paul says. As Christians, we have reason to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. And then in verse 5, he says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. Some translations say gentleness. Let your graciousness or gentleness be known to everyone. I want to pause right there. This is just kind of a side note for the sermon. But is that true of you? If someone looked at you, if someone thought about you, how you interacted, how you thought, how you spoke, would they say that you are a gracious person, someone who is full of grace, someone who is full of gentleness, even with people with whom you disagree? Paul says that if joy fills our hearts, if we focused our eyes and our hearts on the Lord, then we will be so bound, we will have such a firm anchor that we will have a heart full of graciousness and gentleness. He says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Verse 6, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. 
Now, again, I want to emphasize this morning, Paul is not talking about the idea that there's nothing to be afraid of. Paul was in a Roman prison. Paul, at any moment, could have been executed, his life forcibly taken from him. And yet, here's what he's saying, don't be anxious. It's not that there's not a giant to slay. It's the fact that God is with you. It's not that there's not a king who might throw you into a furnace. It's the fact that God will go with you into the furnace. It's not that the lion's den isn't full of lions. It's that God has the power to shut their mouths. Paul is trying to say, don't worry about anything, not because there aren't scary things in the world or unknown things in the world or evil things in the world, but because we serve a God who is greater. Look at how he says it. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. Now I want us to pause and unpack this for a moment. Paul first encourages us to give thanks. In everything, in every circumstance, he says give thanks. And that's something that we as Christians, only we as Christians can give thanks in an environment such as we face today. And why do we give thanks? Here's why we give thanks. Because we believe that every moment, that every action in the long tapestry of history is part of God's plan, is under God's control, and that no matter what we face, no matter what our environment is, God has the ability to turn what Satan intends for evil into something good and edifying for us. Therefore, no matter what we face, no matter what we're feeling, and listen, I'm not trying to downplay it. I know that some people here are in the midst of economic hardship. Some of you have have lost jobs. Some of you have lost your source of income. And listen, I'm not saying that that shouldn't concern you, but I am saying that Paul tells us, take that worry and give it to the Lord. And give thanks to God that he holds you in his hands. That he has a future for you. That his plan for you, though our plans have been shaken, his plan for you has not been shaken at all. And so we as believers, we can go to the Lord with confidence. We can go to the Lord with thanksgiving. Why? Because our treasure isn't in heaven. Our hope isn't in the world. Our hope isn't in the government. Our hope is not in anything that we see with our eyes. Our hope is in the unfailing love of Jesus. Therefore, let your requests, prayers, and petitions present them to God. And then it says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When you turn your worry into prayer, God will give you peace. But if you hold on to your worry, then that worry will either morph into bitterness, it will either morph morph into fear, or it will morph into anger. And listen, we we live in a time where people have very white-hot emotions. Some people are deathly afraid. Some people aren't afraid. Some people are angry. Some people are are so angry that they take it out in terms of violence or maybe people are so angry that they'll take it out on those who disagree with them on social media or they'll say things or think things in their heart. There's a heart full of bitterness and rage. Listen to me. I don't care whether you're experiencing primarily fear right now or primarily anger. If you are afraid or if you are angry, you are easily controlled. The Bible warns us against fear. The Bible also warns us against anger. And listen to me. If Satan can lead you to a spot where you are either angry or afraid, he can easily manipulate you. He can manipulate your emotions. He can manipulate your decisions. He can manipulate and even attack. And this is what I believe is going on. We're in the midst of a spiritual attack where Satan is using everything around us and the emotions and thoughts that we have in response to it to divide us, to make us angry, and ultimately to separate us from the grace that God wants to pour out on us as his children. Listen to me. We as Christians can neither be afraid nor can we be bitter or angry. Because we serve a God who is in control and reminds us that His peace, that peace that passes understanding, is available to us. And think about this for a moment. There is so much that I do not understand right now. I don't understand the science of COVID-19. I don't understand whether the statistics that we're being given are correct or not. I don't understand why a police officer would have his knee on the neck of George Floyd for over seven minutes as he's gasping for breath and asking to breathe. There are many things that I don't understand. But here's what I understand. That God can give me a peace that surpasses understanding. 
And listen, I'm not going to get political this morning, and I want to say this loud and clear. I am so thankful for our law enforcement who put their lives on the line every single day to uphold law and order. But here's what I know, that in the heart of every human being is sin. And it can jade us. It can lead us to make decisions that maybe we never would have made otherwise. And in the midst of these moments, we have to have an anchor. We need a peace that goes beyond our understanding because we know there are things in this world that we will not understand. But Paul says the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And notice that language. We need to guard our hearts. What does it say in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23? It says, guard your hearts above all else because everything you do, everything in your heart flows from it. And Paul says this, that we have a peace beyond the understanding of this world that can guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. Now, I want us to move on to verse 8. And this verse, I believe, is so powerful and so impactful for the moment we find ourselves in. It says this in verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything of moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Now again, Paul isn't saying here, ignore reality. Paul isn't saying, shut off the evening news. Paul isn't saying, get off social media where there's so much negativity. No, here's what I believe Paul would have us see. It's not not that we live our life with our heads stuck in a hole. It's not that we live our lives ignoring the world around us. It's that we as Christians must see beyond the headlines. We as Christians must see beyond our physical sight. And we must see that God is at work in the midst of the turmoil. That God is at work in the midst of the difficulty. That God is with us. That God is just as present with us now as he has always been. And so here's what I want us to see from this text. Is that Paul is asking us to look beyond our physical physical sight. And as we look beyond our physical sight, as we look beyond the headlines, as we look beyond the circumstance, he says that we will notice that which is true. That we will be able to discern that which is honorable. That from a prison cell in Rome, Paul was able to fix his mind and dwell his thoughts on that which is pure and lovely and commendable and praiseworthy. That even though he was unjustly imprisoned in that moment, he was able to focus on what was good. And this is so important, Christian. This is so important, believer, because we as believers have been told, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't let Satan take your eyes where he wants to see them. Don't let Satan distract you by all that he wants to use to manipulate and divide you. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Renew your mind with what is true so that the peace of God will guard you and that your mind will be transformed to love the beauty and glory of God. You see, my concern for for this church is not primarily that we're going to get COVID-19 and we're all going to die. My concern is that this will be a moment where a spiritual disease of fear and a spiritual disease of apathy and a spiritual disease of anger will take over. And the only antidote to that disease is the grace of Jesus Christ. This is what we have to offer ourselves. This is what we have to offer the world. Our only hope is what God is doing in us and through us in this time. But listen, it's so important, and I want you to see the dots connect. Paul says, if you have anxiety, if you have worry, take that anxiety, take that worry, turn it into prayer, and then, once you have done that, focus your uh, your heart and mind on what is true. And sometimes I think as believers, we get steps one and two, take our worry, turn it into prayer. We get those things right. But I wonder, are we disciplining ourselves to focus on that which is true? To focus on that which is good. And as as I think about our culture today, of course, you know, our, our culture, our country is in a bit of tumult, tumult, isn't it? I mean, we have riots going on in different cities, buildings being burned to the ground. But here's what I believe. I believe that that is the overreaction of a few who are irresponsible. But I want to share something with you. 
that yesterday, one, uh, one African-American brother in our church, here's what he sent me yesterday morning. He sent me a text that said this. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. That's a quote from MLK. And then he sent me this verse. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And listen, we can look at the TV screen that, by the way, has absolute monetary incentive to draw our attention no matter what. That's what the TV is going to try to do to you. That's what the news network is going to try and do to you. But I have a brother in Christ who texted me and said, we need to love one another. And as I look around the world, as I look around the country, I believe, and I'm trying to dwell on what's right. I'm trying to look past what Satan wants to draw my eyes to, and I'm trying to remember that even though there is a community of black and brown brothers and sisters who feel grief, who feel pain, who feel injustice, yet the response of more than the majority is to say, love one another. Let's not give in to hate. Let's not give in to division. Let's not give in to separation. But let's look beyond what the eye see and let's see that which is commendable. Let's see that which is true. Let's see that which is excellent and praiseworthy. And here's what Paul says. Don't just think about it for a moment. Dwell on these things. Let your heart be transformed and molded by these things. And of course, ultimately, here's what we know. That even though there is injustice in the world, even though there is evil that exists, that our hope is in the fact that God loved us so much that He sent His Son. And He sent His Son to die. He sent His Son in our place. He sent His Son on the cross. And here's what I believe. Paul is not trying to... to, to to distract us. Paul's not trying to get us to think positively as if that's the, the answer to our questions. No. Paul can say in chapter 4 of Philippians, dwell on what is good and right and true because he has always already said this in chapter 2 of Philippians that at the end of time every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul can say focus on what is good because he had a vision of Jesus that is brighter than the sun that is shining on our heads right now. Paul could look at the world around him as evil as it was, as unjust as it was, as full of oppression as it was, and he could say there is a deeper hope, there is a deeper reality, and it is unchanging, it is fixed in the heavens that Jesus is on the throne, that Jesus is ruling and reigning, and for those of us who are called by his name, that anchor will never move. That is the hope of the gospel. That is the hope that we can offer. And listen, before we ever offer it to the world, I hope that we are letting the gospel transform our own hearts. Because the gospel is first for us. We serve a God who faced evil and took evil upon himself in the form of the Son, Jesus Christ. He died for evil. He died for all sin so that you and I could have life, so that you and I could have breath, not just for now, but for eternity. And here's what I believe, that if we can learn this lesson from Paul, if we can learn in the midst of everything going on around us to focus our eyes on what is true, then God will do a work of healing in our hearts so that we will neither be afraid nor angry. And then God can use us to reach this world. Because church, we are the only ones who have the answer. We are the only ones who have a lasting hope. And yet before we offer that to the world, we have to be transformed ourselves. And church, that's my desire for myself. I don't want to give in to anger. I don't want to give in to fear. I don't want to give in to lies or bitterness or hatred. I want to let my heart be filled with the love and joy of Christ. And I want that light to be so deep in me that it shines out. And the world can...